Well, good morning, happy people. We're all happy people, right? If we're in Christ, even though sometimes things may not be so happy, inside there's always this joy within us, right? Praise God. You know, we live in a world that bombards us with opposing views. We'll hear things like, you know, you need to get plenty of exercise and sleep, but, you know, don't overdo it in the exercise, and don't get too much sleep because you'll become lethargical. Or you'll hear, you know, make sure that you have a high, a low fat, high fiber diet. But make sure that you eat plenty of good fats and don't eat too much fiber. That's, that could be a problem as well. And, you know, if you're not feeling well, make sure you go to the doctor, but only go to the doctor if you're really sick, right? And work hard, but don't work too hard. We have all, in the world around us, the world is full of all this conflicting advice. We hear it everywhere. And everybody has a truth that you must hold fast to, but then there's a truth that somebody else has that's completely the opposite truth. And so we live in this world of uncertainty, a world that is actually not maybe on purpose, but it's what's the natural result. It's actually producing anxiety in lots of people. Most of us don't like the feelings of uncertainty, right? We like to know. And we're, continue, we're finishing off, actually, in 1 John. And one of the things that John does, and he's coming back to his main point here as he gets towards the end of the book, is that we can know. That we can know that we have eternal life. We don't have to worry about uncertainty. There's no anxieties here. There's no, like, oh, but this person says that, that person. No, no, we know we have eternal life. And so we can live in this confidence that we have in Christ Jesus. And today we're going to look at uh, five certainties that faithful believers can count on. See, in these last few verses, we actually have the word know seven times. John uses it seven times. Like, you know, you know, you know, you know, because you're in Christ, you know. And there's this confidence that we have going forward because we are faithful to Christ Jesus. We count on Him as Lord and Savior of our lives. And so that's where our hope is. That's where our faith is. And that's what gives us confidence in this world. We don't have to go around like feeling uncertain about I'm not sure what's going to happen next. We may not know what's going to happen next in this life, but we know God always has us. He's always got us. And so certainly number one is like, we, we talked about it. What is it? We can know that we have eternal life. And the verse, our first uh, verse in our text this morning is, Chapter 5, verse 13, and we're going to move from 13 to the end. But here's the first verse. 1 John, chapter 5, verse 13. It says, I write, to these thing, I write these things, presumably all the things that he said so far, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. There's a lot of things that he's written so far. Some of these things is that we know that, like, Jesus is the Son of God, that He came in the flesh, and through faith in Him we have victory. We can know that we have eternal life. We know that God is light. And when we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. We have fellowship with God. We're one with God. And so therefore we can know that we have eternal life. We, can know, we know that we're not supposed to sin. But we also know that when we sin, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. We know this. We also know that we have an advocate before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's our Lord. He is working on our behalf. We don't have to be concerned. We know that when we walk as Jesus walked, when we lived as Jesus lived, then God abides in us. He abides in us. And we know we have eternal life. There's nothing that's uncertain about that. We know that God is love and that we are His children. And being His children is most best, ex most best? Best expressed when we actually love like God loved us. When we love God, when we love the brotherhood, then we're actually being who we are in Christ Jesus. Now, we don't always do that really well, but we know who we are in Christ Jesus, and we're a people of love. We belong to the realm of God's love, and so we know we have eternal life. In the two previous verses leading up to verse 13 in chapter 5, John had said, reminded us that God has given us eternal life. If you're a faithful follower in Jesus Christ, you know God has given you eternal life. Is God always true? God is absolutely always true. So He has given us eternal life, then we must know it, right? 
says he's given us eternal life, and this is eternal life. It's, it's, it's in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. So if you're in Christ Jesus, if you have the Son, you know you have eternal life. We know we have eternal life. The second certainty that he mentions in this passage is in the next verses. It says, we can know that God hears and answers our prayers. Now, we're going to talk a little bit more. There's a little bit of conditions involved here, okay. But let's understand that if we're in Christ Jesus, then we know that he hears and answers our prayers. Verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us and whenever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give, give him life to those sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. And you're saying, what, what did this just say, Kevin? Okay, so there's some things that, in this passage that bring up questions, but what's the main point again? Let's not get, you know, those, those questions. I promise to answer some of those questions. But what's the main point again? That he hears us, and he answers us. The things that we ask for, he will give us, because there's a couple things that are here, that are here though. There's some conditions that take place. And the first condition is that we need to do it according to his will, right? And so we have this first condition that we pray according to, to God's will. And then we know that he hears us. Uh, this particular type of prayer that he seems to be talking about is an intercessory prayer. Okay, that's his, his focus here, that we're praying the prayer that we pray for the prayer that we pray for one another. And specifically, it seems to be those uh, that we're praying for struggles and sin. Okay? But when we pray according to God's will, we know that he hears us. Now, do you always know what God's will is? Be truthful. Do you always know what God's will is? No, you don't. <laughs> but we do our best to pray according to God's will. But by God's grace, He's also given us His Spirit. And so the fact is that even though we don't always know what to pray for as we ought, God's Spirit Himself intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. And He who knows the, heart, the, the hearts of men knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so our intent needs to always be about the according to the will of God. And when we don't know whether it's for sure according to the will of God, well, what will we pray? According to your will, Father. May your will be done. I don't know what your will is for sure. I pray that I know that the Spirit within me, because we always need to be praying in the Spirit, I know that your spirit within me is going to do this, and I, I, I submit to you, Lord. See, when we pray uh, according to his will, then we know that we have the things that we've prayed for, which pretty much says then, uh, why would you at all bother asking for something that you know is outside of God's will? Don't do it. What's the point? You're just wasting time here, and you're actually confirming something that's not true. That God is somehow going to answer. God is not going to answer that. If it's not according to His will, He's not going to answer it. And so if you know it's outside of His will, don't pray that. See, prayer is not about something where we say, well, this is what I want, so I'm just going to ask for it, and God has to give it to me because, you know, He hears me and He's going to answer. No, that's not the way it works. The primary purpose of prayer is to draw closer to God and to submit to His will in our lives. That's why we pray. And when we get closer to God, and when His will is being done in our lives, that's when we have the abundant life. That's when we're really living the joy that God has planned for us. That's when we're living full lives. And so this is what it is to pray. He hears us. He answers us. But we want it to always be according to His will. Now, there is a second condition, right? Something about, uh, what did He say there about that second condition? So the second condition, well, it brings a lot of questions, right? It says, in praying for the sin struggles of a brother or sister, he basically says, don't bother praying for sin that leads to death. Okay, so, you know, if that sin over there leads to death, don't, don't pray for that. 
but do pray for the sins that do not lead to death. And so the obvious question is, um, John, what are, you, what are you saying here, John, exactly? Uh, are you, so what are you saying that certain sins are not forgiven? Is that what you're saying, God? Or, or John? Well, God through John, right? And we get confused about this, but is it really all that confusing? Is a person outside of Christ, are all their sins forgiven? A person outside of Christ, their sins are not forgiven, right? They, re they remain in the wrath of God. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life because the wrath of God remains on him because he's not in Christ. Okay, right? And so everybody who's in the world who's not in Christ Jesus, well, their sins cannot be forgiven because they haven't put faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we have forgiveness. It's through Jesus Christ. And so why would we bother praying for those sins? Now, should we pray for people outside of Christ? Absolutely. But we can't really pray for their sins to be forgiven until they come to Christ. And so maybe what we're praying for is that they have a repentant heart, that they come to know Jesus Christ. Certainly in the context here, though, what is he talking about? He's talking about those who claim to be Christian. Those who think that they're within the fellowship. And he's saying, well, so those people that are, they're saying that they're Christians. So some of these actually have sins that lead to death. And we say, wait a minute, how can that be? If I'm in Christ, aren't my sins all forgiven? And so this is where we sometimes get a little bit confused. But understand, every time there's a question like this, consider the context, right? Not just maybe even like the verse in front and the verse behind. The whole context. And so one of the things that we've seen in this whole letter is there is a problem within the church there. There are people that have gone out from the church. They're no longer fellowshipping with the Lord's church. And why is that? Do you remember why that is? There's these people that they, did, they thought that Jesus Christ, God, could not have come in the flesh and died. That's not possible. And so they deny that Jesus came in the flesh and died. Can a person who's denied that Jesus has come in the flesh and died for our sins have forgiveness of sins? They can't because that's the only way you can have forgiveness of sins. It's only through faith in Jesus Christ becoming a human being and dying for our sins that we can have forgiveness of sins. And so if they deny that, there's no forgiveness of sins. And so the context here seems to me, it's relatively obvious, like people have all sorts of wild ideas about this, but if we look at the context, that's a pretty basic thing that's going on here. And well, they say that they're Christian, but they're not really Christian anymore because they deny that Jesus is actually the Son of God. And that's the only way we can have sins, have our forgiveness of sins. And so the second condition here, really, uh, it's in submission to the first condition. So we do not pray for the forgiveness of sins of the rebellious or unrepentant heart. It doesn't mean we can't pray that they would have a repentant heart, but certainly don't pray for the forgiveness of their sins because they can't have forgiveness of sins if they denied Christ Jesus. It's impossible, right? But certainly change hearts, a heart that would be softened, that would return, that would get itself right with God again, that would believe what God has done, that would believe God at His Word. That's what we're looking for, right? Again, the main point, what's the main point again? We talk about all this and it says, oh man, but the main point is, don't forget this, God hears and answers our prayers. And that gives us incredible confidence. Of course, we want to do that. It's all about God's will, right? It's all about His will. And when it's all about His will, then our life is so much better. The third certainty that he mentions here, oh, but let me just say one more thing, because uh, I like this verse and I was going to say it, so I, and I see it's in my notes here. Uh, a psalm from... And, oh, I actually, as I, I looked over and I saw Glissel, and I remembered this is her favorite song, actually. Psalm 91. And the last couple of verses, he's talking to those who have put their faith in God. And he says, for that person, when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him. I will honor him with long life. I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And that is true for us who are in Christ Jesus. We are in Him. 
And so our sins are forgiven. And we know when, he talk, when we talk to him, he hears us, he answers us. He's there for us. He's, even in troubles, like doesn't mean that life is all easy, but he's going to be there with us in the troubles as well. And in the end, he's going to show us his salvation. We have it, but he's going to show it to us. Right? Uh, certainty number three. We can know that we have victory over sin and Satan. Verse 18. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who has been, was born of God protects him. Now, presumably we're talking about Jesus in that case. He who was born of God protects him. And the evil one does not touch him. So there's this idea of not keep on sinning. I think the NIV uses the word doesn't continue in sin. And again, from fuller context, we understand that we're talking about, no, we're not talking about the fact that we sin or not sin, because we know that we, we sin. And if we say that we don't sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth isn't in us, right? But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. We know that. And so what we're really talking about here is this practice of sin. Specifically, on purposely, rebellion against God. And it's like those who left the church in this particular case. They've denied that Jesus is the Son of God. And so, you know, they're living that lie. They're living that lie. And so that fellowship that they had with God, it's not really there. They think it's there, but it's not there because they deny the truth that God has taught them in His Word. And so we're not like those people, right? We believe God at His Word. Our desire is to practice the things that God would have us to practice, to seek His will, to obey His commandments, to love, to do good, to stop sinning. And sometimes we get caught up. I, I know I do sometimes. You get caught up in like, oh, I sinned again. But we don't have to wallow in that. God doesn't want us wallowing in our sin. He doesn't want us to be that pig that got cleaned off on the mud and then goes back in the mud and rolls around again. He wants us to, you know, no, no, get out of there, get out of there. I've cleansed you. You're, you're clean. But Satan, of course, he wants us when we sin to think, oh, no, that's it. I don't know if I can come to God. I can't even pray to him now. Don't let that, don't, that's Satan. Don't listen to Satan. Listen to God. He loves you. And he wants you to have a great relationship with him. And so when we do sin, it's not about, you know, that, that's not about those sins that happen. It's about this habitual, I'm against God, no, we're not against God. We want God in our lives. We want to please Him. That's who we are. How does God protect us from sin and from Satan? Where does our victory lie? Well, our victory lies, it's, it's pretty central, isn't it? What's His name again? Somebody tell me His name. Jesus, right? Jesus. It's our faith in Jesus Christ. That's where our victory is found. It's faith in Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, we know that we have victory over sin. We know that Satan, the evil one, has no place in our lives. Now, does not mean, does that mean, okay, that's great, I don't have to worry about any battles in this life? No, it does not mean that at all. In fact, uh, I think Warwick was mentioning something about there, about, you know, and that's the time when we know Satan is at it. Well, we know that Satan is looking for every opportunity. Even when Jesus was tempted, he was tempted, and he was tempted, and he was tempted, and then, you know, he sends him away, but that, what does it say? He waits for a more opportune time, looks for another time where he's going to get him, because that's the way he is. And so we recognize that there's this, always this, this um, battle that's going on, this, 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 and it's not against flesh and blood, right? It's against the spiritual forces of evil. And so what does Paul tell us? What's the armor of God again? Why are we putting on this armor of God? Because it, we're in, it's about the strength of God, not about my strength, about His strength. And so we fasten on the belt of, of, of truth, and we put on the breastplate of righteousness, and for shoes on our feet, we put on the peace that's in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we take up the shield of, of, of faith, and the helmet of salvation, and we take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and we're praying all the time in the Spirit, because we recognize there's a battle going on. But it's not about our strength. It's about living in the strength of the Lord. And so we know we have victory over sin, and we know there's battles going on, but we know who is on our side. Which brings us to the next point, that we can know that we are God's children living in the strength of His power. His power. Verse 19. 
We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil. When the whole world lies in the power of the evil, but about whose power are we in? Whose strength do we have? We have the Lord's strength. We know that we're from God. We know that we've been adopted as His children. We know that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. That's who we are. We're children of light. And so we walk as children of light. The world lies in the power of the evil one, but we live in the strength and power of God. Earlier in our text, John had said uh, a a favorite uh, verse for a lot of people that, you know, he was in the world, he was in us. (laughs) He who is in us is greater than he was in the world. Yeah. He is in the world is not greater than anything. Definitely not greater than the one who's in us. Maybe greater than a lot of people, but not we are in Christ Jesus. God's power is at work in us, and we have his strength to guide us. We are his children. He will always protect us. He's always there for us, and he will give us the power to overcome. What does it talk about? No temptation is overtaking you. It's not common to man. God is faithful and just, and he's going to give us that opportunity. He's going to give us that a way of escape. He doesn't want us to fail. He's going to give us that way of escape so that we can endure whatever that temptation that's coming along is, right? Um, one of my favorite verses in the Old Testament, uh, Joshua, we, he's uh, about to go into battle, right? And God is, has some words for Joshua. God already told him, I'm going to give you the victory. The victory is yours. You know, I'm going with you. I'm going to fight with you. You just do what I say, and everything's going to work out. You're going to have it. Does that mean the battle's going to be easy? Does it mean there's not going to be a reason to be afraid sometimes? Fearful? And so what does God say to Joshua? He says, be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. Why? Because the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And that's something we need to hold on to. Jesus said similar words, didn't he? It sounds like, it doesn't sound like as much of a battle, but really it is. When Jesus says the Great Commission, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I commanded you. What does he say next? And behold, I am with you always. Always. To the end of the age. The reality is, some of those early disciples especially, they would be persecuted for it. They'd be thrown in prison. They'd be killed. But they recognize that, you know, even Paul at one point, he's saying, you know, everybody else has left me, but the Lord hasn't left me. He's in prison. Like, oh, everybody else deserted me, but God has been with me. He's my strength. Even when everybody else leaves me, yeah, God is my strength. And that's what we live in. That's the confidence that we live in. That is our certainty in Christ Jesus. Uh, Last certainty, last few verses. We can know him who is true. And who is it that is true? It's Jesus Christ. It's God. Uh, Some scholars say, well, is he talking about Jesus or is he talking about God here? And I say, "Um, yeah, I think so, yes. Right? It's one of those things where he's a little bit ambiguous, but I think he's ambiguous on purpose. We have eternal life. We are in him who is true. We are in Christ. Here's what he says, verse 20. And we know that the Son of God has come and given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So there's only one person that can make us right with God, and that is Jesus Christ. He is one with the Father, and He is the true one. If we have the Son of God, we have life. We have eternal life. If we have the Son, we have eternal life. John's Gospel, in talking about Jesus, he says, he calls Jesus the true light, calls him the true bread come down from heaven, the true vine, and in fact, he is in fact the truth, right? And knowing that we have the truth, that brings a certainty. Those uncertainties of life, we don't have to worry about that because we know that we are in the one who is true. It enables us to live in confidence, and our confidence is found in that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Now, just a caution here, because sometimes what happens is when we get confident, we start to get a little bit arrogant. There's that, that line there somewhere, right? And we can never forget that our confidence is in what God has done through Jesus Christ. Our confidence is in Him. So yes, we have the truth, but that's not a truth to like hit people over the head with because we're right and they're wrong. It's not like that. That truth says, I love those people that don't seem to have it right yet. In fact, I might even lay my, down my life for those people because that's what Jesus Christ did. And that's the kind of attitude that we need to have as we go. We have this great confidence, but it's a confidence that's based in Jesus Christ who humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And that's who we are. That's who we are in Christ Jesus. The last verse uh, sounds a little bit out of place and maybe a little abrupt, but I don't think it's out of place at all. He says, what does he say? Little children, keep yourselves from idols. They're like, wait a minute, what is he talking about here? All of a sudden he's just going to talk about idols? Well, what's an idol? Anything that you worship that's not God. Who is Lord of your life? Is there, is there more than one Lord of your life? Anybody? You got more than one? He's Jesus Christ, right? Only Jesus Christ. How do we be right with God? How do we have this confidence that we have eternal life? It's through Jesus Christ. I'm going to go ahead and put this up here because I'm going to... How do we, I'm going to say it this way. How do we know, but how do we have confidence that God hears and answers our prayers? Well, it's because... It's through Jesus Christ. It's faith in Him. How do we have victory over sin and Satan? Because we put our faith in Jesus Christ. How do we have confidence that we are God's children and that we're under His protection, that we are living in His power? Well, because we are in Christ Jesus, in the true one. We have Jesus. And although all the world around us might want to uh, lure us away, And there's lots of lures out there. Take this as a caution. What does he say? The last words, like, this is to stick with them. What does he say at the last end? He says, keep yourselves from idols. Don't you go dabbling with something else to take take over to usurp Jesus Christ as Lord of your life. No, you can't let Jesus just be a part of your life. And, well, he's just going to have this little part over here, and we'll have this part here and this part. No, no, no. Jesus is over everything in my life, over everything in your life. You cannot have some, so, something else that's going to like take priority. Not even, you know, well, only 20%. No, 20% is no good. Jesus Christ needs to be 100% Lord of our lives. Amen? Amen. This is what it's about. But here's the thing about all this. Isn't this incredible? That we don't live in this world. We're not. We're, of the, we're around the world and all that, but this is not our home. So let's not get drawn into the way the world goes, where it's like, oh, there's all uncertainties. I'm not sure. Well, you're supposed to do this. No, no, wait. You're, well, this other study over here says you're supposed to do that. Well, I don't know. I, I, I have so many anxieties in my life. I don't want... That's the world. We may live in it, but that's not who we are. We belong to Jesus Christ. Praise be to God. We belong to Jesus Christ. God sent His Son for you and I. Isn't this good news? And this is what we live in. This is our confidence, brother. So take that confidence to heart and know it to be true and live in the confidence of Jesus Christ. May God bless you, His church.